Hello everyone, I'm Shannon Slatton in Maple Grove and there will be a new voice representing Maple Grove and District 7 on the Hennepin County Commission and that voice will be Kevin Anderson. He joins me now. Thanks for spending a few minutes with us. What did you think about the win? You know, it was uh, it was pretty gratifying to uh, to see the hard work pay off. Uh, my team and I, we worked for the last year, uh, reaching out to voters, texting, calling, uh, getting our message out to, to people every way we could. This is certainly not the way we thought we would be campaigning, but uh, it was very, very gratifying to, uh, and such an honor to be able to, uh, to be able to serve on the county board. All right, now the work begins. Yes. And one thing you spoke about uh, during the campaign is congestion in this area, yeah. helping with traffic and transportation. Can I have you touch on that? Sure, well, District 7 has really been exploding with population. We have new developments coming in and we haven't really been keeping pace on our making sure that we have options for transit and transportation. Some of our roads are falling behind in our, our infrastructure, and I'd really like to try to focus on how we can invest in those infrastructure projects so that we're taking care of our community. All right, and another issue that you touched on during the campaign is mental health issues. Can I yes. have you speak on that? Absolutely. So I think that uh, Hennepin County, we spend about 40% of our uh, budget on health and human services. And making sure that we have access to mental health services is something that I really believe is important. If we can build partnerships with places like schools or with libraries to get uh, mental health professionals or uh, caseworkers available to people where they need them, I think it would be a real benefit to our safety and well-being of our community. All right, and Kevin, finally, when you were out and about in the community or online and hearing from people and their thoughts and concerns, yep. any other topics that you want to mention? Well, you know, we, we talked with people that are concerned about the environment. Uh, obviously, people are always concerned about their property taxes. We want to make sure that we're spending money wisely. Um, and so we have to make sure that we're balancing all of this. Uh, COVID is obviously a huge deal. We're still dealing with it. We're in the middle of a pandemic and it's not going away unless we uh, are really making sure that we're taking care of our neighbors. And so I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, taking care of everybody. Lots of work ahead. Thank you yes. very much for spending a few minutes with us, Kevin Anderson. And of course, if you want more election information, we've got all the results posted on our website, ccxmedia.org. Brooklyn Park residents can expect to see voting polls again as soon as next spring. This time it's to fill the city's mayor position. On Tuesday, current Brooklyn Park Mayor Jeff Lundy was elected Hennepin County Commissioner for District 1. He's currently serving his third term as mayor, but since he will be sworn in as commissioner in January, there will be about two years left on his mayoral term. City staff say the city council must order a special election to fill the balance of the unexpired term. If 365 days remain on the mayor's term, within 45 days, the council has to declare a vacancy and then call for a special election. And that also is gonna be a citywide election, meaning that I'm gonna open up all 24 polling places as well, and then be staffed by election judges. Montero says there are specific dates that a special election can be held. As of now, the city is looking at April. He says if there are more than two candidates, a primary special election is required. Mayor Lundy believes the race for the Brooklyn Park mayoral seat will be a crowded one. I figured there'll probably be a dozen. Um, and right now I'm kind of wondering if we did add a primary after because I was the last person who ran in a special with the unfortunate passing of Mayor Lampy. And so uh, it'll be a good scrum, I suspect. And uh, I think there's some good candidates out there that are going to be running for office. And between the time Mayor Lundy moves into his new role as commissioner and the special election, the mayor pro tem will fill Lundy's position. That would be Lisa Jacobson. For CCX News, I'm Pafua Yang. There's still a lot we don't know about Tuesday's election, but there are a couple of things that we do know. On a local level, the Minnesota legislature will remain status quo after the Republicans maintained their hold of the Minnesota Senate and the DFL maintained their majority in the Minnesota House. On a national level, Minnesota stayed blue and voted for Joe Biden. I reached out to Hamlin political science professor David Schultz to find out why. Joe Biden did campaign in this state, 
unlike four years ago, where after the after at that point we still had a caucus. After the caucus, when Hillary Clinton got beat by by Bernie Sanders, she never came back to campaign during the general election. And this time, Donald Trump did come back campaign several times, but of course, Joe Biden also came back and campaigned, and so he took it seriously and didn't take Minnesota for granted. Schultz joined me via Zoom on the day after the election. He says another reason Biden won in Minnesota is because a greater percentage of the state's voters reside in the Twin Cities metro, which is an area where Democrats have done traditionally well. Meanwhile, the state legislature is another matter altogether. Schultz says the rest of the state tends to vote Republican, and the voter turnout for the president proved to be a big boost to GOP candidates further down the ballot. Initial results show that the Senate is on track to finish with Republicans keeping their 35 to 32 majority heading into the next session, which means that we'll have another two years of divided government. This means that what? The governor's authority on the coronavirus and the pandemic, probably he'll keep doing what? Every month, another ex another round of executive orders. Um, this also impacts the issues of reapportionment, the budget next year. So it kind of guarantees a status quo in terms of Minnesota politics. Schultz says that a divided legislature also means that when state lawmakers come together to draw new congressional lines next year, it'll likely be hard for them to come to an agreement. That means that we're likely going to see some court battles in the coming year. In Brooklyn Park, Delaney Cleveland, CCX News. The Wayzata High School football team will look for a second straight win this Friday night when the Trojans host Shakopee. In this week's CCX Sports Spotlight, we meet two brothers enjoying a final season together. Brothers Julian and Sean Diedrich grew up playing football in the Wayzata Youth Program. Now the two are on the Trojans High School varsity for a second straight season. Fake. Good throw by Harvey and open as Dietrich down the field. He breaks a tackle on midfield. Sean is a senior running back who wears number 26. Julian, number 11, is a junior wide receiver. Both have played big roles in the Trojans offense this fall. Harvey will hand it off. Diedrich getting around the edge. And the Diedrichs are good players to coach. The two great kids both are uh, filled with personality. You know, they make it, uh, they make it fun at practice. Uh, you know, uh, they're always good to be around. Um, but uh, not only good football players, both hard workers. You know, they come and, and bring great energy to practice every day and, and really uh, are a joy to coach. While both brothers earned valuable playing time in 2019, the Trojan State Championship offense was, especially late in the season, built around then senior running back Christian Vassar. Here is Vassar, he breaks a tackle, he's in the open. Still, there were lessons to learn from watching. The fact that Christian was there put me in another situation that helped me grow. Because Christian is a humble guy, he knows how to work hard, and him along with a lot of the seniors last year really showed us you know, what a championship team looks like, how they act, and how they execute. It was a dream, you know. I'm, we had less of a role last year because, you know, we were just younger than everyone, and that's all right. But it was just that the team was special, and the bond that everyone had together was special, and especially playing alongside my brother. It was really fun. The brothers admit to being competitive at home, but support each other on the football field. Admires what their sibling brings to the field each week. Him and I are both pretty athletic and, you know, He's been a running back just like me for most of his career, and it was just last year he switched to receiver. And, you know, he has what it takes to go up there and do what he does, right? He's fast, he's strong, and he has the hands for it, you know? He just runs with violence. He's a, he's a little dude, but he's strong, and he can deliver a blow, and he hits the holes phenomenally hard. Julian is listed on the roster as 5 foot 9 inches. Sean generously at 5 foot 8. A relatively small stature drives both players. Yeah, little chip on their shoulder, and they play. They play the game with a ton of heart. You know, uh, they don't let uh, any of that define them. They they kind of come on and say, "Hey, we're going to work hard, and we're going to and we're going to go out and prove what we can do." And they consistently both do that. Something that me and Sean have that some other that other opponents don't have uh, is speed and utilizing your speed. You know, knowing how to slow down and speed up effectively and make a defender miss in space. Open field is. It's not hard, I mean, it's hard to tackle a small dude in space, so that does help. You know, I just have to work with what I have, 
So, you know, I, I'm not the largest guy in the field, but so what I have to do is just be physical, you know? I use what I got. I'm pretty strong, although I'm, at, I'm not the biggest, but, you know, when I'm in the weight room, I can keep up with the weight room, with the old lineman. Sean is looking at college options for next year. Both brothers express a desire to play football at the next level. For now, they will enjoy their final weeks as high school teammates. Oh, into the end zone. Oh, my goodness. We've always kind of had this dream, this talk about, oh, I can't wait till we're both on varsity so we can score touchdowns together and be, you know, offensive weapons for the Trojans. And it's just always been a dream. And now it's, now it's truth. Our play of the week is back again this fall. And here's a look at last week's winner. Number 21, Kelly Kahns of Maple Grove Girls Soccer scored this goal against Brainerd in the Section 8AA semifinals. The play earned a record 5,400 of your votes in a week in which over 12,000 votes also at CCX record were cast. There are five new plays to choose from this week, so vote by Monday morning. For your favorite, go to ccxmedia.org, click on the Sports tab, and then go to Play of the Week.